And that is the reason why a vast majority of Compass members backed Ed Miliband to be the leader of the Labour Party, and they were right to do it. Thank you, Ed. Um, Caroline Lucas, um, who I also agree with on practically everything. She just happens to be in a different party from me. But the, the important thing is that she believes in everything that I do and wants what I do, and that's the most important thing to me, and I'm delighted you're here, Caroline. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to, um, to respond to this evening's debate. And I've thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. I agreed with 99% of it. It was an impressive and incredibly honest analysis of the problems we face as a society. And for those of us who do care about the public realm, it was also a daunting summary of what we've lost as well, I think. The private sector has largely divested itself of moral and social obligations to employees, to local communities, or wider society. And as you say, the pursuit of profit has itself taken on a moral dimension, so that business leaders or pension fund managers can not only betray their human responsibilities, but actually see such betrayal as a duty and even feel good about it. And the spread of that attitude to the public sector has, I think, had appalling consequences. Public services, as you, as you say, have become commodities, citizens are treated as consumers, and of course if you're defined as a consumer, if you don't have any spending power, then you're a non-citizen as well. And yes, perhaps David, you're right when you say that popular movements can help with the realignment that could start to win back our public realm. And certainly, as you and Ed have said, the public response to cuts to our libraries, or indeed attempts to fell off, sell off our forests, show how little support there is for the direction that this government is trying to take the country. But the point that I would make is that political movements, sorry, popular movements, popular movements on their own cannot do the job. They are a vital part of the solution, but on their own they cannot do the job. There has to be action on the political level, both to provide leadership and to put that popular will into effect. So take public services. When you have all three main political parties in the UK committed to the private delivery of public services, that denies a voice to those millions who believe in the ethos of public service, of the ability of public bodies to do better than the private sector when they are given the chance to do so. David rightly points out the deadening effect of the way in which modern political marketing means politics essentially offers three flavours of vanilla to a pretty bemused electorate. Politics, even political parties, are at risk of becoming irrelevant or maybe even worse, simply mechanisms for the advancement of a professional political elite. And that's why I think that part of the realignment that we have to seek must be a reinvigoration of politics, including comprehensive electoral reform, so that the will of the people has a genuine purchase on the decisions made by government. And I would disagree that there is no alternative to the neoliberal world view. It's true that the public realm has been under attack for 30 years, first under Conservative administration, then under New Labour, now under the new coalition. But those governments were not or are not fully representative of their members or supporters or indeed of their philosophical traditions. As David has said, Marx and Burke both help ex explain our current predicament and the way we could respond. And similarly, while agreeing that no one school of thought can have all the answers, I would argue that green philosophy is uniquely relevant for our times. I would argue that it is, after all, a response to the very problems that weigh heaviest on us, particularly in the West. And I'm thinking of overconsumption, diminishing resources, alienation, rising inequality. And I have to say I was a bit surprised that that green philosophy didn't feature a bit more in your lecture, because I know it has done in other things that you have written. For a century or more, progressive politics has sought to increase our national output in the hope that with a bigger overall cake to share out, the haves would be prepared to accept a smaller percentage share of it, if the amount they received in actual terms continued to rise. And so as the economy has grown, so elites have been persuaded to give up just a little bit of their wealth and a little bit of their power. They've accepted a little bit more taxation and redistribution. They've allowed political power to be spread out a little bit more thinly. But that approach has two consequences. 
First, it gives the illusion of greater equality, while actually allowing for the greater concentration of power and wealth in the hands of the few. And thus it was, after 13 years of new labour, we ended up with a country more unequal than when they came to power. And second, that prosperity itself is often built on rotten foundations. So I would argue that the uncomfortable truth is that the growth that has paid for our welfare state is built on the exploitation of our natural resources and all too often on the exploitation of people here and around the world. So this approach cannot continue when we've exceeded the capacity of our planet. Here in Britain, we've already consumed three times more resources than the world can sustain. And when that whole approach is based on taking extra shares that come at the expense of the developing world and of future generations. I'd, often, I'd argue that often with the best of intentions, the pursuit of increased <coughs> national wealth as a means to promote equality carries within it the seeds of its own failure. For well, throughout the years, progressive politics, whether it's Labour or Socialist or Social Democratic or Liberal, I think has failed to grasp what it really means to understand the essence of equality. We are all equal. And equality doesn't stop at the borders of the United Kingdom, nor does it stop with the present generation. I think true equality means seeing every human being on the planet as having an equal call on us. And those whose world we are destroying, those whose precious resources we are using up, whose species we are making extinct, whose seeds we are poisoning, whose beauty and tranquility we are sacrificing, those, in other words, who are yet to be born, we owe them just as much as we owe those around us today. And so in seeking to bring about this realignment of progressive politics, I would lay down this challenge. If we believe in equity, and if we believe we have an equal responsibility to every citizen in the world and to future generations, then our realignment must be based on the rejection of the traditional model of economic growth. And so I would say to David that there is a political party out there, be a small one, that does not want us to get back to business as usual, that sees that the economics of business as usual is precisely what has led us not only to economic destruction, but to environmental collapse. And so I'm not suggesting that we return to the Dark Ages, but I do think that we need to explore how we live within our means, and that in doing so, I believe that will actually make for a better society than the one we have at the moment, a more equal society, a more just society, and a more sustainable one.